So I asked you to bring an abstract. I want to see if we have time to work in class, but I think we won't have time to work them in class. But what I want you to do is to exchange abstract with someone else, whoever has printed, exchange your abstract with someone else, and then uh, during these two days, it's one of you look in the abstract of the other one and see if they follow this logic here. Or how could they change their abstract to follow this logic and give them suggestions, you know? Okay? So you do it in the break. So or do it now if you feel like it or but exchange them and then uh, you do this exercise during the week. Sometime you discuss it, okay? No, we don't do it now. You do it at uh, some point. We don't do what? Share or? No, you share now, but we don't have to read it now. Okay, so let's move to the next part. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So now we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit. Sorry, Rita. Let's start the class. Sorry. So, you can do it in the break, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now I want to, I'm not going to talk about the psychology of writing in general because I don't know a lot about it, but there is a book that I mentioned that I was looking at, which is called How to Write a Lot, which is a, uh, some there. But I want to talk about two issues that I see as crucial uh, in uh, the psychology of writing. So maybe psychology is not the perfect term, but to, let's say, not structural or writing type, but like how you see writing. And these two things are, the first one is your relation to your manuscript. I will call it the subjectivity problem, but by this I don't mean that you're subjective in your opinions or your arguments. I mean that you're subjective with respect to your product, you know, it's your baby. And at some point you have to distance yourself from this baby. Maybe you hate also this baby, but <laughs> love it or hate it, you know? There is some, some very personal, uh, emotional uh, attachment to this product that can be good, can be creative, but also can be bad. So we're going to focus on the ways it can be bad and try to see how we can escape them, okay? And the second thing I'm going to talk is a little bit about the stumbling uh, part of writing. So some of you may have... Uh, face the stage where you can't write, no? You want to write, but you can't write. You say, no, I can't write an article. You know, it's impossible. You try to do it, you postpone it, etc. So we're going to focus a little bit on the psychological part of this. And we're going to talk about some ways of uh, avoiding some problems. And this will lead us to the other part of the, pro which is the process of writing, how you can organize the, a writing project. So about the su subjectivity problem, what do I mean by this? <laughs> It's a problem that sometimes you get so connected to your paper and you put too much work in it that it's very difficult for you at some point to look at it, let's say, a little bit with the eyes of someone else other than yourself, you know? You're too messed into the details. And you are too emotionally invested in the process of writing the article. And this can be problematic in some sense. It can be problematic, first of all. It can be problematic when you have to do reviews and change the paper. A very common element is like, I put so much work on writing that, you know, I can't take it out. This is impossible, you know. I spent like three weeks writing these two paragraphs. How can this reviewer ask me to take it out? So that's, that's one problem. Another way this can be a problem, and this is what I mean, I can't cut its hand, you know. I can't cut all this big part of my article, you know. But another way where it can be problematic is when you lose, and this you know well, no. When you lose the, you lose the big picture, so you get, and this happens to all of us, so don't feel uh, that you're in particular in that, you know? But you get so immersed into your conflict, your case study, your, the people you're following, the projects you're following, and then you say, no, I have to say all this. It will be unfair if I don't describe this thing, you know? It will be unfair if I also don't say that. Or people 
will not get a good view if I also don't describe what is happening in this other project and in this other project. So you get too committed and then you feel you have to say the whole story. So you lose balance between details and the big picture. And this is happening all too often in articles, you know. Uh, I mean, in articles by PhD students, you read in it's too much details of the case that they are not necessarily falling into, falling into the overall arguments. Because people are too, they can't zoom out and see, okay, what is important there? And I can tell you that this is happening a lot to me too. For example, I've noticed, and this is like a very strange thing, you know, I've noticed that when I have to write articles on my own research, it's very difficult for me to escape from the details and write a short paper. I get, I also, I also get it a lot, you know, I say, oh, no, I have to say this and that and that. I can't simplify. Then when I collaborate with PhD students, like when I collaborate with Theta, it's super easy for me to see the big picture and then cut and say, no, this out, this out. You know, then Etam gets out and say, oh my God, why this out? But I'm the objective reader there. And I say, no, this out, we have to say it very simply. You know, you don't need all this stuff. Uh, I can do it very well. And I simplify a lot in the articles of others, but I can't simplify my own work. So the trick here is some tricks for you to benefit from this size of others, you know, or even make yourself to be another and look a little bit in, into your own text with the eyes of the others, which is a, which is a, is a tricky part. I mean, another pro pro problem with this is that sometimes you get too messed in, into your own work, your own field, your own way of thinking, that also you use language that you don't realize other people do not understand. Theoretical language, empirical language from the people you are working with, you know, like you, you lose the, the picture that you're talking to someone else who might not share all these common language or assumptions or knowledge with you. And sometimes the other thing that can become problematic by being too attached on your document is you, are, you forget the reader and you assume that they know what you know, you know. So you take certain things as granted knowledge. So you say, okay, I know that things are so complicated in my case study in Campania, you know? I know all the complications, so probably the reader will know too, you know? You have to think that your reader is someone from uh, Wisconsin who knows nothing about Campania. Might, they might not even be possible to spot it in the map, you know? They might know anything about waste. So you always have to think with the eyes of this reader, not of the reader who knows more or less what is happening in, in Campania, you know? You have to think of the reader who probably hasn't even thought about Campania, but is interested in the same theoretical issues. So for this reader, what level of detail do you have to give that will be relevant for this reader to understand your manuscript? So some ways to temper subjectivity, this particular type of subjectivity I'm talking about. First of all is to acknowledge it as a problem. So to know that it's a big part of the writing process is how to, to deal with this issue of subjectivity of you with respect to your manuscript. This means you know that it's an issue, you know that it's hard, and you're trying to deal with it. It's impossible to avoid it completely, but you know it, that it's there. So a few tricks that uh, I, 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 I would advise, and I've taken also this advice from other people. So one, the most basic thing is to leave the article aside for a while and then read it with fresh eyes. I mean, I gave you now the two papers we wrote, the two versions, and now I see the second version and I get freaked out. You know, I said, oh my god, so many mistakes, or I would have written this differently, or what I'm saying here, this is bad English. So really, I got freaked now that I had to read the, the review, and now I'm very <laughs> pessimistic, I think it's going to be rejected, you know? And my co-author is writing from his honeymoon in Greece, and he's telling me, I'm sick. <laughs> it's still under revision, bad sign, it's getting rejected, you know? But now that I saw it, I also got freaked out that it's going to be rejected. So, if you read your manuscript, but when I finished it, I said it's perfect, you know? <laughs> so, leave it aside for a while and come back, it makes a huge difference, you know? Huge, huge difference. The thing we all do is to give it for comments to colleague, colleagues. Colleagues who could be your reviewers. Who could be your reviewer? This I learned in a recent presentation I attended. It was a very interesting uh, shift of mind for me. So normally when you think, who will review my paper? You always think some big name in your field is going to review your paper, no? So you send to Antipode, you say it's going to be Michael Watts, I don't know, David Harvey, maybe, <laughs> in his free time reading your article. Very unlikely, no? More than likely, the people who most review papers are postdocs. So they are the highest and most burdened reviewers. And then I've heard a bad practice, which I don't do, but I was surprised to hear that it's done, that professors give as an exercise or to benefit, the, from, they give it to their PhD students to review papers. I was sent one by a, by a reviewer. Me too. Or an editor. 
then they send to PhD students, they invite them as reviewers. The thing is right now there is a shortage of reviewers, an incredible shortage of reviewers because there are too many journals and too many articles. So your reviewer, and this is something I learned, it really changed my way of saying things. Don't assume your reviewer is someone who is uh, very mature in their way of thinking and very quick to understand your paper. They're probably someone like you, you know? That they have also problems of comprehension themselves when they read something. <laughs> So they have to understand you, they have to understand you, you know, and this makes it tricky. We're going to talk about it in the review process, but the reviewer might not understand exactly what you're saying, if it's a postdoc or a PhD, you know. But what does this mean is that you can benefit by getting comments from your peers. So you can send it to one another and get comments and don't say like, okay, what does uh, X know more than me? No, we are in the same stage, they didn't understand my paper, so their comments are, are not so good. So I'm not going to take these comments into account, I'm just going to take into account the comments of my supervisor. No. Send it to one another and really take seriously how the other person reads it and what they tell you. If they didn't understand something, don't assume that it's their problem they didn't understand. It means you have to explain it better. If they miss your overall points and your overall thesis, it means you have to make it even more clear, you know. It doesn't mean that it's their problem. So what we do normally, up to now, I wasn't doing that. So normally what we did with the paper you saw this summer that we wrote with Giacomo on, uh, on, uh, on the Sarno case, I don't know if you remember adaptation and uh, the Gramsci perspective, etc. We sent it to seven people for comments. We sent Stefania Barca, Ugo Mark, uh, David Sauri. So all these people, uh, Eric Zwingendas, all these people send us comments, you know, <coughs> before we finish the paper. So then, when you get the comments, suddenly you see your paper with the eyes of someone else. This is an important, important moment in this subjectivity process. Because one thing we are naturally inclined to do is to say, oh, they didn't understand it, they didn't read it well, they have other things in your mind. No, that's a moment for you to, to, to take off, let's say, your emotional investment to your work and your insecurity and your investment to protect it against others, you know? It's like, Really, if this person is telling me this, there must be a reason, you know? Let me see it through their eyes. Why, why is Stefania Barga is reading my paper with his eyes? What, what is he trying to say there, you know? Maybe I don't agree with what she tells me to do, but like, let me try to understand why she says what she says. Because more than likely, another reviewer might read it with the same eyes of Stefania Barga. So you have to get into the shoes of the other. Yes, to me. I'm curious how you, when people are so busy, how you get them to read your papers, for example? <laughs> because they are friends. Okay. Huh? <laughs> and because you'll do the same back to them, so it's a gift economy. So you will have to do the same to them. So I do it and then I ask them. So it's as simple as that. And if it's someone who is a special, who is an expert in the region where you did your work, for example, it might know more details or it might be a good leader. Is there change of something else if the person's not an academic person, but rather like... No, but you need an academic, that's what I'm saying. You need an academic and you don't need, even need an expert from your region, you know? Actually, you don't need, you need someone from here, you know, because your reviewer, one reviewer might be an expert from the region, you know? So you might want also an expert from, from the region to give you comments, but you need also the average reviewer also to look into your paper. And it's a friend that you're going to give it back also for comments later, you know? So it works a lot like that. So whoever does me the favor, I do the favor back, more or less. But uh, uh, no, yeah. it doesn't change uh, from journal to journal. Like the, I think all the journals are the same kind of. Uh, no. So when we when we wrote the paper from annals of geographers, the one you had to read today. I send it mostly to geographers, you know, so I wouldn't send it to an ecological economist because I was mostly interested <coughs> from how a geographer would read it, you know. So it depends where you're sending it, you pick up the people also in, a, in this yeah. way. So you try, let's say, to sample the average reviewer of your, possible reviewer of your article, thinking that this average reviewer might not be someone super experienced also, you know, so don't think about the top people only, you know. You just need someone who could be the average reviewer of your article. So you also don't run the risk that this review will actually be approached by the editor as a reviewer? Well, that's not a risk. I mean, this is the opposite. You have to be careful there not to burn reviewers, you know? Because if, if you want your article to be... If I want my article to be reviewed by Maria, that I know she's going to be a little bit favorable as a reviewer. So I won't send it to Maria for comments not to take her out of the review okay. process, you know? So, the, okay, that's, that's a little bit more of a silly strategizing. But, 
If you send it to someone for reviews, they're not going to be your reviewers. So if you want them to be part of the reviewing sample, and especially if it's someone you cite a lot, and they are obvious candidates to be reviewers by the turnout, yeah. mm -hmm. then you don't send it to them. You prefer them to have them as a real reviewer. Okay. Uh, quick follow-up question: Do you do you like what's the etiquette? There? Do you tell if you're sending Maria a lot and and you suggest that she's a reviewer? You know, you don't send her the paper yourself, but would you tell her, oh? You know, I'm suggesting you, so you might get a paper about this. No, no, no. That's, you don't no, I, I wouldn't do that. No. I wouldn't do that. I mean, I think the reviewing process has to be objective, and you should never know if someone reviewed you or not, even if it's a, it's a good friend, you know? So this I would keep out of it, yeah. Where exactly is, uh, is it possible to suggest a reviewer? In some journals, they ask you to ah, suggest reviewers, others not. But, but journals are running out of people, so ecological economics mm -hmm. asks you to suggest up to five reviewers, and then I know that of the two reviews of your paper, one is going to be from the five you suggested. As an editor, when I am, I always try the people, the, the reviewers people suggest in the journal we were running here. But then I try to get also one random one to make sure that there's no bias in that, you know? But like if a journal asks you to suggest reviewers, it's very likely that one of the people you suggest is going to be your reviewer. So you can think of that carefully. Another possible reviewer is someone whose work you cite a lot. That's what an editor does. When they get the paper, they go to the references and they see who you cite. If they see you cite someone they know, they're going to send it to him or her, you know? So that also, that, that also matters a lot. Whose work are you related to? Oh, but only if they know in the or here. Oh, if it's part of the journal. So if you send to Geo Forum and you cite, I don't know, Gavin Bridge, who used, he was the editor of uh, Geoforum, and you cite him four times, it's very likely that he's gonna, they're gonna ask him to review. Now, if he has time or if he wants to do it, it's a different issue. Something about etiquette, your knowledge uh, in, the, uh, in the article, if it's ever published, the health and the readings of these colleagues? If you need to send them people later, do you put this? You acknowledge them after you publish them. You acknowledge yeah. them when you publish it, but not when you submit the article, because yeah, you don't yeah. want to disclose your identity or who helps. But at the end, you always thank them. Yeah, of course. So the trick is, and this is difficult, is if you can read also your own article thinking you're a different person. I've done this sometimes, you know. Like I had some exchanges with my colleague here, Jeroen de Berg, about the growth. He's against the growth. So sometimes what I was doing is I was reading my article and I was imagining, okay, I'm Jeroen. What would I? <laughs> <laughs> what would I say? What would I say here? That's how to respond also to counter arguments, you know. But this gives you also an external perspective. And really, it makes a huge difference because once you start thinking differently, you say, oh my god, you know, this thing that I take for granted, it's like, it really has to be supported much better, you know? Someone might have a very different view than you. And finally, what I do, but this is more for style reasons, and I'm going to explain it back, is I read the article backwards at the very end. So you I'll explain this later, but you can start reading from the last sentence up <coughs> rather than. Sentence by sentence backwards. No. Wow. What does this do? What does this do? This is particularly for improving, improving your grammar and your expression. Because when you read it like that, you don't read it with the flow of the argument in your mind. So you just see the sentence. So you're another. You're just an editor, a language editor. Or you know? So you see it's sentence. And then, okay, you can, you can spot the mistakes, uh, the grammar mistakes, or the English mistakes, or something that escaped you. Uh, uh, Sandy was telling me now that they published a paper and they, they had an opening quote. What was it? The blood the runs through yeah, our veins. Yeah, it was like a super epic, um, the most important for the article, something like uh, the blood going through your veins is like the water through our pipes, no? for this history of water in Barcelona. And uh, in the very, 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 very final version, the last one, the, the proofs, someone, I think it was reading it like that, <laughs> that said, okay, it's written the other way. It's, when we didn't say that for the first time, we wrote the water through your veins is like the blood through our pipes, and <laughs> no one saw it until the last proof. No one saw it till the last moment. So how can you see that? Because you are invested and you always think you've written it correctly, but when you start reading backwards, you know, you just focus on the sentence, you say, oh my god, you know, what is this saying here? So this, this is the one way to do it is by reading backwards. <laughs> So now this is the other important psychological problem. No, it's like I can't write. 
This how to write a lot uh, book has a, it's, it's mostly about that. So it's advice on how you can try to write uh, to try write a lot. So I suggest reading it. Uh, I find it I found it useful. So I read one or two chapters that I'm summarizing here in a slide. So it's a very very over gross summary. But if you want to look at it more. But like, it has some of the standard excuses people give to themselves not to write. And some of the responses, practical responses on how you can go over them, okay? So one of the standard uh, responses is I cannot find time. Now I don't have time. I do this, I have that, I have this managerial task, I have this in my personal life. You know, I, don't, I can't find time. What everyone advises there, and I take their advice very seriously, is to allot time for your writing, just for writing, though, for nothing else. Not for emails, not for reading, not for anali analysis, not for data. Just for writing your article. Allocate as much time as you want, but allocate it and ruthlessly defend it. Say, like, every morning. Some people work every morning. I don't do that, but I've heard many people do that. Like, from 9 to 12, I just write. Nothing else. But really nothing else. If I ask you for an appointment at 11 o'clock on Tuesday, you're going to say no. This is my writing time, so you really have to defend this time. And really, these three hours, sit and write. If this fits your character, right? there are different characters, but the important message here is allocate time and defend it, and then say, this time I, I will have to write one way or the other. If I can't write, I'm there waiting, but at some point you will write, you know? Mm -hmm. would, would you write more than one article at a time, in the sense, like this month I'm writing two articles, for example? Yeah, this, this depends again on the character. I, I can't do it. For me, it's like I'm one project person. If you can't work on two things, it, but allocate time to writing. If it's for one article or for two articles, but it's your writing time, you know. Mm -hmm. And you decide what you're doing this time. If you can run two projects in parallel, it's fine. But just make sure that there is a very clear part of your schedule that it's writing time and receives priority over anything else at that time. Another common. Um, Common complaint is like, okay, I haven't finished yet, no? So I need to analyze and look uh, more on my interviews. I need to read some more theory. I realize I miss data, I miss information, no? This is, this is quite common. You say, I'm not ready yet to write. And the point there is, it's fine, you know? Do all these things if you still want. Analyze your interviews. Read more articles, read more theory. But not in your writing time. So your writing time is for writing whatever you can write on the basis of what you've done. Tuesday, 10 to 1, I write. I don't read interviews, I don't read theory on that point. Like later on Tuesday or later on Friday, I can read what I think I'm missing, you know? But at your writing time, stick to your writing. So another thing that hasn't come across me, but maybe it has come across you, but the book has it, is I need better conditions. There is not enough light, there is too much noise. I don't know, if, if you have this excuse, it doesn't work. The book says it doesn't work. All it takes to write is pen and pencil. But what about your mental space? Like, if you just no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> your mental space. Okay, allocate time. I think, like, really stick to some time. But like some days, it's like, oh, today I can't. Nothing comes on. Nothing. Oh, but that's the point of having a regular program, I guess. Create a habit. That you do it. Create a habit. habit. Yeah. So what they are saying, what they are saying is like the writers are saying it's really important to create a habit. You know. So like the final point is like. I wait for the inspiration, now I think it's this one. I suffer from writer's block, some people say. No, it doesn't come to me now, the inspiration will come, it's not the right moment. So what this book is saying, it's right. First of all, you're not Hemingway, you know, so we're not getting <laughs> great inspiration from you. But that's not good enough, no? Because maybe you're very good and you write something which is very creative. But the interesting thing is that if you read the biographies, even of authors like Hemingway with all his Tormontous life, getting drunk, you know, all these things we know about these people. They had like very strict schedules actually writing and very strict habits, you know. They would write every night or every morning from that to that time in this typewriter in this room. So it seems that habits and uh, sticking to your habits helps a lot for writing. So yeah. try to do that. So if our writing time is 9 to 11 in the morning, then we don't have to come in the morning this week? <laughs> <laughs> Not only, yeah, yeah. You start next week, yeah. I think, <laughs> I think the other thing important to remember is you can always delete. Because I think part of the problem with a block is that you think, oh, I'm, I, I haven't had the perfect way of thinking. No, I mean, you write, mm -hmm. and then it can always be deleted or re reworked or whatever. And I think just the process of... Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, yeah. I mean, if you're waiting for it to be perfect, it will never... Yeah, I mean, this again depends on, on the style, but this is important too, no? Uh, we're going to go into that, but... Don't try to be perfectionist. When you have to write, write, you know? And then you can always go back and improve it. 
But in the writing time, right, not solid. It's maybe write also random thoughts if you're not in a, in a group. Yeah. One suggestion that was really useful um, and which helps me overcome the block uh -huh. is to separate the writer and editor, and this was something that was raised now, because usually when you write, uh -huh. you go back to it and you think of you know editing it, and it just yeah. bogs down the writing yeah. process. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing. Don't try to be perfect while you write, and don't try to edit while you write, because you can spend hours and hours mm -hmm. in one sentence, mm -hmm. and then suddenly you move to the next paragraph and the whole argument changes before, you know? Mm -hmm. So when you write, try to write well so that it makes sense, you know, but move on. The, pro the idea is move on, move on. Improve and move on. But don't improve perfectly because you will always get back and maybe something has to go all together. So there's not value in spending like one hour improving one paragraph that at the end might not have to stay there. Okay? So the process of writing. So I want to talk about three stages. Planning, writing, and then revising. And then we will move to the reviewers thing. So about planning. So I think is to treat a writing project as a, as a writing project, you know, as a whole. So I have to write this paper as a project. It's not just the writing. There are many different stages as we discussed. You know, there is a review, there is sending it to friends, there is reading some extra literature. So there are various tasks. So try to identify these tasks. <coughs> Don't just start writing and then you discover these things along the way and they sidetrack your time. You know, like try to think, okay, if I, if I was to finish this article, what do I really have to do, you know, I have to send it to Yorgos, I have to, to read this extra paper, I have to do this. Write all the things you have to do before you finish and then try to, to organize them a little bit. The outline is really important to have an outline for your article. I'm going to explain this a little bit more detail. Set concrete daily goals. This might be too ambitious, but if you can do it, this would be good, you know, like say, okay, this week or this day, I want to progress like that. Like some people are saying and they find it useful to say like, okay, each of my writing days, I write 500 words of text, no matter what. It can be 300, you know, but you can set some target and then monitor yourself and say, okay, I did it, I did it, or I didn't do it, you know, then I do it the next day. But a little bit set your targets because otherwise many times what happens is like, okay, you set the targets and then you enter the last week, you haven't written anything, you get demoralized. Try to send some intermediate targets and try to, to meet them. Monitor progress is important. Like, okay, I said that this week I'm going to finish with the abstract, but I'm going to finish with the introduction. Did I do it? And sometimes it's important to use your peers to monitor your progress, rather than you monitoring your progress yourself. That's why it's important to have writing groups. You try to do it here, but it's really important to use the help of your peers and help them back, you know? Like, they tell the, you what are their goals, and then they report on you. And you tell them what are your goals, and you report on them, to, the, to them, you know? I mean, no one will kill you or no one will tell you something, but just the very fact that you, you know there's an external reference for what you're doing will help you do it more, you know? You're not just uh, responsible to, to your own self and you don't get lost within your own thoughts and your own preoccupations. You say, okay, I have to send to Angelos 500 words of text by this week, you know? So, okay, I'm going to write 500 stupid words of text or whatever in my writing time and I'm going to send it. It doesn't have to be necessarily that it's perfect, but I know, I know that there is something I have to do, you know? Otherwise, the writing projects can drag forever. So the outline, <coughs> I would recommend that, but I mean, here I'm talking like about the uh, personal practice, but I would say the most important building block of an article is the research questions and the arguments you are making. The, the arguments you are making are the, the answers to your research questions. Okay? I'm making four arguments, you remember? Why did the West extend the franchise? Because the elites were afraid of revolution and because they wanted to give a promise of future distribution. That's the basic skeleton of your article. This, I think, you have to have it very clear before you start writing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's impossible, I know. You start writing and you discover it along the way. Or I don't want to be too strict here. But I'm saying the process of discovering it can start early on, when you structure the article, rather than when you start writing it, you know, and say, okay, which are my research questions and what are the main arguments I'm going to make? We're going to talk about the sentence outline there. Then you can list a little bit the evidence you have for each argument. So I have three arguments. What evidence do I have to support each argument? This is an outline. Mm -hmm. So it's two, paper, two pages, two, three pages, but that's a basic substantial outline of your paper. Then you can make a structural outline, which is like introduction, 600 words, uh, methods, 
400 words, the structure of your paper, okay? And you know it, more or less, what's, what you want to do. So there is a substantial outline that I think you should always do at the beginning, rather than leave it for the process of writing. And of course, be flexible with changing it. And then there is a structural outline. So the, the last part is the sectional outline. It's write down the sections of the paper with word limits in each. That's what I normally do. So I say the introduction, 500 words. I calculate also. And then I try to stick within it, but without getting too obsessed at the, at the initial point. Is there like a rule about more or less uh, how, I mean, of course, the results and discussion section is the most. But yeah, I would like say uh, out of the 8,000, I always go for 600 introduction, 400 conclusions, so that's 1,000. Then maybe some theory literature methods, like maybe 2,000, 3,000, and then you have 5,000 for results and discussion. But that's where the beef of your paper should be. So what is the sentence outline? I mean, I don't have time to go over that, but I, I, I put this document in your, in your Dropbox folder. I have explained it to my students here. But a sentence outline is a different way of doing an outline for a paper. So it's not like contents and headings, mm -hmm. but you are outlining your arguments, you know? So this is a sentence outline of what a sentence outline is. So this is a meta-sentence outline. So it's telling you what is a sentence yeah. outline. And you're saying, you commit yourself to an argument right away. One, you can see if your plan scheme will be persuasive. Two, since it's only an outline, you can change it without throwing away a lot of pros. Two, it is useful. Why is a sentence outline useful? For three reasons. For two reasons. When deadlines change, you have something to show at any time. You can get advice from colleagues early when it's useful. What, what does this thing do here? You are outlining your arguments, not the contents. You are not saying here, I'm going to explain why you have to commit to a sentence outline, and here I'm saying why is it useful. You know, that would be, that would be like the headlines of your outline. But here already, with short sentences, you are forced to outline what I'm going to argue here. And scientific papers are all about arguments, you know, that's the, the heart of, our, of what we are doing. And it's really easy, I found it, after, once you have the sentence outline, to say, okay, this paragraph should, should uh, develop that, the next paragraph should develop that. So you have the argument as the very sen first sentence of your paragraph, and then you, you develop it, you explain it, you back it up, you you flourish it, you know. But you need to know a little bit your arguments at an early stage. It's really hard, eh? That's easier said than done. It's really hard to come up with your arguments so clearly. But I mean, this is part of the process of trying to do it. Otherwise, if you just start writing many times, brainstorming while you write, sometimes you get lost with what your arguments are. I mean, the other thing you can do is like, if you write brainstorming writing, which is fine, at some final point, go back and think, okay, what are my main arguments? What's the outline of my arguments? Does the whole thing stick together? Is there a logic of arguments that runs out through the paper? <clears throat> so about the process of writing. So this is my way, and I'm saying uh, my way because I've heard people doing very different things. So I guess it depends on your zodiac now. So <laughs> I'm a Virgo, and I hear Virgos are super stuck with organization, they like to put their things in their desk where they meet, you know, I know there are others who put piles of papers and they are much more creative, so it depends now. So this is, this is for where it goes only, but uh, <laughs> other zodiacs can tell us what's their approach to writing. So how I do it, I start with a hypothetical abstract, so I write an abstract even if the paper is not there, yeah? Yeah, I can do it too, you're a weirdo. No, <laughs> but <I'm not. laughs> this is what we do for conferences, right? What most, most people do for conferences, yeah, you yeah. write an abstract for a paper that doesn't yeah. exist, yeah. and then you yeah. That's write true. it. Before. So I write a hypothetical abstract that follows the structure I told you. So I know more or less what I want to argue, but I haven't argued it yet. But it's <laughs> ideal, you know? So mm -hmm. maybe I don't have the evidence to back up the argument I'm making in the abstract. But I say, okay, ideally, what would I like to do, you know? Then me. And that's uh, different from Elisa, that's why I'm saying it's very particular. Then for me, I really want to write the introduction, you know, I want to have clear the motivation, and then I want to write this section 2 does that, section 3 does this, because for me it works very well to know where I'm going, you know, but some others are working differently. I've heard people who start writing different parts from different sections, and then they start editing them together. And then they write the introduction at the end, saying what's the logic. So for me, then I write the introduction, and then I write section by section 
trying to stay within the words limit that I put to myself. Like if this section is supposed to be 1,000 words, I try to write around 1,000 words. Now if I write 1,300, it's fine because there is the editing. And I also, what I do is I work for days in a row. So I don't work like from 10 to 1 every day. For me, it's like one week, I'm going to write the whole day every day, you know? But well, that's again, it's different. But it doesn't mean being writing all the time. It means that that day is for writing, but and then write, you know, I write some, uh, some <laughs> email, <laughs> and I have the email then, and then yeah. I beat to email lists, you know, because I'm very angry with my paper, so then I write angry emails. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, leave me alone, you know. <laughs> 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 It's because he's not good. Exactly. <laughs> 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 uh, after you wrote this, oh, this is after. This is the process of writing now. So the, the first was the process of yeah. planning. That's the process of writing. I'm kind of confused between the substantial outline and the sentence outline. The substantial outline is the the substantial outline, like the introduction, yeah. 300 words. Then results, like section 3.1 of results is going to be this, section 3.2, this, and that words. The sentence outline is, these are my research questions, and this is what I'm going to argue in the results section. Okay. Okay. But then you use the sentence outline for your abstract? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. <coughs> so the revision process. So this we just said it now. Do not strive to revise and be perfect while you write. Try to be as good as possible, but within the time limits you've set for yourself. So that's important. So that's why it's important sometimes to plan. If you say like this, this day I want to write 500 words of text. That's your time limit, that's your goal. Revise as much as possible to write these 500 words. Or today I want to write the introduction, okay? Mm -hmm. Or this week I want to write the introduction. So revise, don't write a text that it's incomprehensible or full of mistakes. But don't revise perfectly, revise given your time limit. So your time limit comes first and your revision comes second, you know, because you're going to have more opportunities to revise later. So what I do, I mean, this is reflecting on my practice that I didn't think about it uh, as I presented, you know, it came over, over time. But what I do is I have like different stages, different types of revisions. So I have at least four re revisions. The fourth one, I do it if I really, really care about the paper. For, for some papers, I don't do it, you know? So the first revision is content-wise. So you have a draft which is 10,000 words. You've written more or less what you want. So the first revision is, okay, I read it again, and I try to improve the content. That's a normal one, no? I don't like this, I don't like that, or here, it's not. Okay. So it's called content. The second revision is uh, when you have to meet the word limits. So the word limits are probably eight to 9,000 words. Maybe you have 14,000. That's really bad. If you are around 11, 12,000 and you have to cut 2,000, then you are okay. So how do I do that? I say, okay, how many words do I have to cut? I have to cut 1,000 words. And my paper is 20 pages, okay? So I say, more or less on average, I have to cut 50 words per page, okay? So what I do is then I read each page, and my goal is to cut 50 words from that page, no matter what. You follow me, no? rather than do the whole paper. So in some pages, you might cut a lot because you say, okay, when you see it with this, so again, this is part of you getting out of, the, of yourself, which is the, the writer of the paper. So you get, you get into the shoes of the editor then, you know? So you say, okay, this page, no matter what, I don't care how important it is, it has to be 50 words less. How do I do that, you know? And then you get more committed to sacrifice something. So you say, okay, this sentence, does it really need to be like that? Do I really need this further more or this more over or by way or saying in addition to, you know? If I have to really cut 50 words, maybe I don't take it out, you know? Not further more, just go straight to the point. And you, you save one or two words. And what I do is I go literally page by page, you know? And then it goes down, yeah. But we know that this is obvious at, the, at your papers, eh? That you do it. Like, uh, <laughs> that's good to me. It is something that, that is, I, I can see that uh, here there, were, there was uh, a word <laughs> that's been that killed. That's, that's, killed. That's, that's, killed. Killed. that's the word that is missing. So, that's the problem. So, uh, uh, no, I say that because 
I want a little bit to merge this thing with the previous uh, comment. Yeah, that's a problem. I mean, the problem was like, for example, the paper you just read, it's for a special issue and their limit was uh, 6,000 yeah. 6, words, all including, you know. Yeah. At the beginning yeah. it was 5,000 And you words. mentioned it several times. So we sent, we, sent, we sent the first paper with Hook and we had 6,000 words plus 1,200 in footnotes, you know. The footnote trick. But the Reynolds people are not so dumb, so they count on the footnotes too. And we sent it Friday and then say, okay, if you don't have this paper rejected, by next Friday you send 5,000, 5,000 all inclusive. Oh. Then who starts panicking, what's up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? And then I write, I say, no, they had said 6,000 in the leaflet, so they were contradicting themselves because they were asking us for 5,000, but in the leaflet announcing the special issue, they had said 6,000. So I write back to them and we say, no, no, you said 6,000. <laughs> and they say, okay, 6,000, but footnotes included. So basically, we took all footnotes out and we took a lot of these precious words that you found lacking. You know, I, I'm saying that I, w I would like a little bit to, to say this thing because of the previous thing that you said yeah, about, about, the, about, about the perfection. Like when you write, it's good to write, you said before that it's good to write a relatively good uh, text for, for sure, but, uh, but not to, 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 you know, to pay so much attention to be like perfect because of time restrictions mm -hmm. and constraints and so on. But maybe, I was thinking that maybe if you start on a different way and try to be, to have a final, um, a final text from the, from the beginning as, as possible, mm -hmm. as much as possible, then gradually, year by year, you can be like uh, better to this. Yeah, yeah, no, and that's, so, that's for sure. So, and so you can a... also save time and at the same time, the final text will be more uh, cohesive than a very heavily Yeah, but that depends. Like, for example, uh, when I was writing as a PhD student, for me it was really difficult to write good sentences or good paragraphs while I was writing. And also, it was very common for me to have 15,000 or 18,000 words text for an 8,000 paper, you know? So I know that this is really difficult. By now, I think more or less the way I write is uh, very close to the final. So I really edit while I write. But I know that when you're a PhD student, it's really difficult to edit as you write, you know? So what I'm saying is like for the time being, try to edit. I think the key word in what you said is as much as possible, you know? So don't get stuck there, but as much as possible, yes. But that's why time limits are important, because this as much as possible, if there is no time limit, can get you stuck in the introduction forever, you know? That's the problem. Yeah. Do, you, do, you, do you think there's a, like a language thing in terms of the word limits? With, with the American or English style of writing that is very succinct and short, and for instance, the Spanish, because even like Latin American journals, they have 12,000, 14,000 <coughs> word limits. Yeah, there is. And so, so I don't know if, they, if this is something that. Uh, yeah, there is, but I mean, yeah, that's the journals we are working with, you know? So yeah, no, 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 they need to be 8,000 words. But there is definitely a different style of writing also changing your language. I mean, this, so you, this you all know, I don't think I have to repeat it. Like that. The Latin languages are using much more many words and they are much richer and wealthier in expressions <laughs> than uh, English language, no? In English, uh, no, but I mean, English writing can be a lot. When you see French authors translated in English, there is still this same feeling of a rich and complex phrasing translated to English, no? But like, normally, most Anglo-Saxon writers like a little bit more straight to the point and shorter sentences. This is something to find over time, yeah. Something that I find interesting, I, I was reading recently the guidelines of Geo Forum, mm -hmm. and, and they say the, the word limit is 9,000 words, all included, whatever. But if you can make it shorter, you know, the shorter the better. You know? If you can make the same points with yeah. less words, and that's something that the guy, the guy you were talking about before. Yeah, also says. it's valued a lot to be straight <laughs> into the point. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing. Okay, third stage of revision after counting the words. So when we have a final text, then we send it for the community review. So we send it to friends and colleagues and we get comments back, no? And then we rework it. And probably we'll have to do a little bit of this again because we have to do content-wise uh, changes. And then again, word cutting because probably people ask you to add things, improve some arguments, etc. So you have this, you have to do it two times again, but a little bit faster this time. It's not as much as the first time. 
And then the final thing that I do in articles that I really, really think it's, it's, a, hard, uh, it's a hard publication, like the one in Annals you read or when we published in uh, NAS, the Prostudics of the National Academy of Science, I pay attention to each single phrase, you know? And this you can do it the way I said, by reading backwards. So you try to perfect it, each single phrase. But this takes a lot of time. So, but the more, the more important the publication is, the more perfect. It, uh, I mean, not the more perfect. Perfect is perfect, no? But you have to, to approach perfection. But supposedly, as a first article, as a first submission, the likelihood that your article is very good is less. So if you do this, is it a good thing to do? Yeah, because you maximize your chances. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to maximize your chances given the, the context where you're submitting. Yeah. So the other thing I want to say is that there's no problem if you change, you know, if you change late in the process. You can always change your research questions, your arguments, uh, your, even your methods, the way you describe your methods, your interviews. You can change all these things until the very last moment you submit, you know, or even after that. So about this, don't worry, you know. Be brave with changing things, you know. Be brave that, okay, this is what I thought were my research questions, but after my, the people from my community read it, they told me that it would be better to phrase my research question this way or add this literature. It's fine, you know. It doesn't mean you didn't do your work. But keep the core. Eh? Keep the core. Of the keep the core, team. yes. Keep the core, but be, 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 re be willing to be flexible to change, you know. Don't be stuck to what you've done at the first phase and then say, okay, I can't change through that or these are my research questions. Like, always be flexible to change. Okay, the review pro process. So we're gonna close with that. So here I won't, I won't. <laughs> we, we're, gonna, we're gonna discuss a little bit the, the articles I sent you, my articles, no? With whom? Okay, we'll have a good time to discuss this. But first I want to say some psychological problems particular to the revision process. So this is after you send your, your article to a journal and then you get back the revisions from the journal, you know? That's a tricky uh, process. It's a tricky moment in the writing of the article because normally the time you, you receive the revisions, you have already moved to a different project, so you're to your next project. You're doing research or you're writing another paper. So once you see your revisions, like, oh my god, I can't go back to that, you know, I'm done, you know, this, this is like 2009, you know, it's like, <laughs> time moves, you know. <laughs> now half this is built now, you know, I can't, <laughs> the island has changed, you know, like, how can I go back and write again about the island? No, but you have to do it, you know, so, you, the, how can you do it? I mean, I don't know. One thing is to remind yourself <laughs> <laughs> why were you writing this piece of paper in the first place. <laughs> Try to remember your youth when you were excited about it, you know? But you have to remember why you are doing it. Because unless you pass the review process, the revision process is not going to be published. I mean, it's the most important process and comes at the worst moment. So you have to do an extra effort for that. It's the moment that you are out of thinking in this paper, you are out of... Uh, of being passionate about it, you're passionate about something new, but you have to go back and do like really difficult work. So it's really tricky, this thing. So many people <coughs> give up on that sometimes. They say, oh, I can't do these revisions. You know, it's too much. The benefit of being at that later stage is that you're a little bit distanced from the work, what we were saying before. So on the good side, you can see it with fresh eyes. And you can also be a little bit more brave because already a year has passed, perhaps, since you finished the article and say, maybe they are right. I mean, I can take all this section out, you know? You're not so heavily emotionally invested to the article at that stage. So this is on the good side of, of having some temporal uh, distance. So the other thing is very common, I find the problem, is that many times you will feel, and that's normal, that the reviewer didn't understand what you were trying to say. <laughs> or you might think that they are biased, no? That they come from a particular community or from a particular line of thinking that doesn't like your line of thinking. Someone who might disagree with your findings, they don't like them politically or scientifically or whatever. So you might have this feeling. I would say don't have them, you know? <laughs> Treat them as humans because of course they are biased, but who isn't biased, no? And of course they didn't understand your paper, but which paper did you fully understand, you know? <laughs> 
So it's very normal that someone doesn't understand you, misunderstands you, or is biased toward you. This is fine, but like try to engage with them, try to convince them. So this is a this is a game of con 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 convicting people. So you have to to convince them about your argument and about your your data. So don't take it personally, you know, and you don't get into this super defensive uh, position like, oh my god, they are so mean, or yeah, people can be mean also sometimes. But if they haven't rejected your paper. You can still fight it, so that's a good uh, point, you know. So forget. I mean, try to also neutralize your emotions. I don't neutralize them very often. So sometimes you get very angry with a reviewer, you no, know? and then you get very offensive with them. Mm -hmm. But it's a little bit an asymmetrical uh, relation. <laughs> so if you get too angry with them, they can always reject your paper. Although, to be honest, I have colleagues here who are very aggressive with reviewers, and I found this also working sometimes. Yeah, and they are very aggressive with editors. This works, why? Because the editors, I've been an editor, so you know that you don't do your job perfectly because you have very little time, you see things very quickly. <laughs> so if someone suddenly attacks you, you, say, you didn't pay attention to my paper, you know, there's this, this, this argument completely escapes you, you haven't put enough time, you get a little bit, okay, maybe they caught me here. <laughs> yeah, but it depends on what, who is... It depends, it depends, it depends if you caught them, because if you, if you counter attack for a reason that you are not right, then you lost it completely. But if you are attacking, counter-attacking for something, you are right, and you've noticed that they didn't pay enough attention to your article or your, then you can cut them, and then they get like, okay, we have to take this more seriously, maybe I send it to another reviewer. So I've seen many times, for me, me, I would never respond to a journal if they rejected the paper. I would get sad and then move on to the next journal, you know? <laughs> but I found colleagues here that they write very, very aggressive and let us know you didn't read it well, this reviewer was biased, the other was like that, send it to new reviewers, I really demand it, it's a disgrace of your journal, this, and it works sometimes, yeah. you know? it's not. <laughs> but it depends how <laughs> far you find yeah. 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 But I, I find that uh, the way that you respond yeah. to reviewers, I don't know if we're going to discuss that later. Yeah. 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 We're going to discuss this later. Oh, oh, okay, because the, 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 the way you said for the record, you know, the yeah, yeah. Sound yeah. Sound yeah. Sound yeah. this, this was like, a, like, like an attack, but it was yeah. a very nice uh, way of yeah. attacking, like what we said. Uh, Actually, you know, uh, Harvey doesn't discuss this uh, as much uh, as you expect us to do. Uh, so, you know, I thought so this I, that's why I sent you this review, not because the paper is. Uh, I mean, I don't know if the paper is going to be published, so maybe it's not published, but I was happy with our response to the reviewers. Very good. It was a very good response. <laughs> because it was a little bit of this tricky balance, like, you know, it was like, you know, if someone pushes you, it's like, okay, push me, but not too far. <laughs> yeah, we said, uh, I, we're sorry that you didn't understand, that it was confusing. We sent it to eight different people before. <laughs> and they, they, nobody said it was like that, so <laughs> we are surprised. So it's a little bit of this tricky balance, you know, like, okay, I really take your criticism, I, I absorb it, but I'm not like, because if you get yourself too much into a victim, yes, thank you so much, you know, you're so <laughs> right, I was so wrong, then you get in a losing position again. You, know? you have to be like, okay, I get what you tell me, I will improve, but okay, stay there, you know, like there are some things that I really know what I'm talking about and probably you don't know, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky one. But for me, the expression for the record, maybe I don't know, maybe because I, it sounds so aggressively American, like it's like, for the record, ah, yes. like something like that. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I hear it, and I could, be, I could see you saying, So maybe I did a mistake, I see, that's a mistake. This is how it's it's No, maybe I did a mistake, because for me, for the record, uh, you see, like, ah, this is the problem okay. if you're not a native speaker. Yeah. Like, for me, for the record, I thought it meant just for the sake of it, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's out, but. I, I have to, ar to argue yeah, still, yeah. you know. Yeah. No, if it was aggressive, it's a mistake. Because there I didn't want to be aggressive. But what, what, what the sign sent there was like, okay, I took this out anyways, so don't worry. But like, notice that you also as a reviewer didn't do your job perfectly. Because you didn't understand that and it was quite clear what was being argued there, you know. Mm -hmm. So this puts also the reviewer a little bit in, a, in an equal position with you, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. You say, okay, these people can also cut me back, so I don't know who they are, maybe we did a mistake and, <laughs> you know, they get angry and that's the end of this article, which is very likely, you know, I think it's like 50-50 for it to pass, so it's not an article that will be published for sure, but I mean, the point is like, okay, how do you try to fight your case as, as well as Let's possible? Let's bet, is this going to be published or not? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, but I'm not, I'm not very optimistic, anyways. So the other, the other problem is like, okay, when the review comes, 
the the big problem normally you have is like they ask you to do big changes and it feels for you really painful to do big changes. They ask you to take out whole parts, you know, or you have to take out whole parts. I mean, I know that it's difficult, but that's that's what it is, you know. I think you have to be brave and be willing to take uh, big parts out. And that's what I tried to say a little bit, uh, that's what I, tr I tried to say a little bit before, you know. You are emotionally invested to your article, but there is some point where you have to cut the hand of your baby, you know? I don't know if it's a good metaphor. <laughs> That's too emotional! But it shows, it shows how bad it is, you know? It's good Lawrence very busy. It's good Lawrence very busy. Why is the baby male or what? Yeah, because you Lawrence don't have a baby. Yeah, but I say the, ba the baby's male or my baby male. Baby no, <laughs> violence and children. Ah, violence and children. Violence and children in academia. For a metaphor. <laughs> okay, bad metaphor. No, I think it's a good metaphor because it shows how ruthless you have to be, you know? Like but, you know, maybe it feels better if you think that I'm going to take the hand and put it somewhere else. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Not the baby. Yeah. Yeah. Just put it in a different side. Change the haircut of your baby. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's like the forgotten words. That's why I to change the haircut. I mean, you can change the haircut of your baby. Feel free to change the haircut of your baby. Because, like, we said, the core is still there. The idea is the main core idea. Are, are still going to be there. You just make it. Different. Yeah, but like, look, look. For example, in our paper, in our paper, we had to make two. Two. So we start discussing about the paper now. So you're afraid to jump in, okay? So in the paper, we had to make two big uh, decisions. So what, what do you think were the two main changes within the paper that were a little bit, let's say, big? Eliminate the cases. Changing the cases and uh, turning from. Uh, Specific theoretical approach, not approach, uh, space, let's say, from open and closed to another one. Yeah, so, yeah, this discussion of open and closeness was, was very big. We had examples, we had to switch it, not take it out. Then we had a case study on the cooperative integral, and we say, like, okay, this is not the case, case study of the paper. And then we had also, and this I think is risky, you know, we had this concept of dialectical utopia. Mm -hmm. you know, it was even in the title, and then we gave up on it. I mean, this is risky, because if someone thought that the main contribution of the article was the electrical utopia, they can tell us, okay, you took it out, but uh, you lose a lot like that, you know? So these were big decisions. To be honest, we weren't very heavily in invested emotionally with them, because the electrical utopia was a little bit more a last-minute thing, taking hard way to use it, and we find it useful. Then. The cooperative integral, as you saw, we didn't do really field work. If you had spent three years investigating them, it would be really hard to take. I mean, it was a shallow empirical research. So you can say, okay, fine with it too, you know how. But in terms of work, to take out all the paragraphs you saw that we had written about cooperative integral and take them out, that's a lot of work, you know? Yeah. And this is where I say that, you say, no, I can't do that, you know? It's too much, too much to start doing all these things, you know? And you're, we are at the phase that, I thought this paper was done, I was doing other things, you know. This is the tricky part, but this is where you have to be brave when you do revisions. Because I think the reviewers really appreciate when you see from you a willingness to really change your article. I think so, I mean, unless you don't change it to a, to a worse article, but they appreciate that. And they really know if you really change. So some, some people, what they do and I think is wrong, is they pretend they change, but they haven't really changed the article, you know. And then they try in their response to the reviewers, to pretend that they've done a lot of changes, but then when you see the real article, it hasn't changed a lot, you know. So for major revision, this won't trick the reviewers of a good journal, of a mediocre journal maybe, you know, but of a good journal, they won't be tricked by that. If they ask you to change something, they expect you to change it, you know, or to address it. They don't expect you just to fool them with empty words in the response uh, letter. They want to see some change. And you, you gesture that you took them seriously. Okay, I took you seriously and I cut one of my two case studies. That's, that's a huge uh, decision, you know? Mm -hmm. What happens if the comments you get from the different reviewers are not really uh, complementing each other? Yeah. Like, how do you know, you know which one to follow and which one to this or to... Okay, to so what, what do you think we did in yeah, our did, article? Did, uh, I, I think you got elements from all of them, but... Um, you know, maybe something that one says, for example, about, you know, I think the third one didn't mention uh, something that the two previous ones did about the, 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 the idea of dialectics. 
But the reviews were quite similar in your case. The first two, yeah. The first two seemed to agree that. Uh, so talk loudly, so we're having a discussion. Yeah. The first two seem to agree that uh, uh, the novel. Well, I don't know, two of them agreed that the novel thing was very interesting and then one was more like a case study, mm -hmm. right? I think, if I remember correctly. And then you went more with the, with the novel. I think it was more tricky because I think the, first, the, one, the first one was saying the novel and then the first one was positive, obviously. Yeah. So the first one had approved the paper and was saying the novel is the strong part. Then the second and the third one, which are obviously more negative, especially the third one. Yeah. No? Uh, they were saying, uh, what about the case study? Why don't you elaborate it more? Maybe you want to focus yeah. there. And I think the third one was clear that they saw, he or she saw the innovation of the paper in the case in the study. Case study. Yeah. But as I told you, for us, uh, the case study we hadn't done a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And the novel was also what interested us the yeah. most. So mm -hmm. we were lucky that the first reviewer had suggested the novel. So what we did there is we turned the first reviewer against the others. Yeah. So we said, Okay, according to the first reviewer, suggested the novel, we go for the novel. If all three had said focus on the case study, it would be difficult for us to argue that. But, but the, I mean, the third one, also, he didn't, uh, I mean, I think he won't be, I mean, I think he would be understanding your move because he was out of honesty. It was not a matter of like, I want to write about a case study. I mm -hmm. want to make a point, and the only way I can make that point, which is mm -hmm. the purpose of this article, mm -hmm. is by focusing on this specific mm -hmm. data, which mm -hmm. is the, the novel. And I think, I mean, a reasonable person kind of like would understand that ar kind of argument, right? I mm -hmm. would say. Because it's a matter of honesty of, of you as a writer yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, and of them as yeah. reviewers mm -hmm. who are not supposed to impose what you're writing about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, right? Well, I think it helps our case, let's say, to always point, but also another reviewer is on your side. You know, sometimes yeah, it yeah. helps. Well, but that sounds like focusing only on the like on the struggle between reviewers, which is maybe it, it can be avoided. You know, it can be avoided. I mean, we would do the same even if the first reviewer was not there, and then we would have to just argue yeah. our case why we focus on the novel. Yeah. You know? But the fact that the first reviewer was also praising our approach with a novel give us more fodder. So to answer Penny's uh, question. If you have contradicting views of reviewers, you can play with them. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the point. So you can use them according to what you want to do. Yeah. So the uh, 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 reviewers are, are always contradicting one another. They are different people, yes. But finally, do you think that the fact that you put together a novel and a very concrete case study made the article like less homogenized, like mm -hmm. less... Mm -hmm less cohesive like like in general because for me it was also a little bit weird to to read uh, for a, a novel and after for a CIC for mm -hmm. instance mm -hmm. I think that uh, it was too diverse let's say to so I, I can see the point of the of the of yeah, never mind did others feel yeah. the same or yeah. not I, 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 thought it was, uh, I thought it was very innovative, but I mean, it, maybe it didn't fit the pattern of a traditional journal article. But I didn't think it was confusing to have the three things discussed at the same time, the theory, the case study, and the novel. Mm -hmm. I think, but, sorry, no, no, and just, just to, I mean, I thought that the case study contributed to the Nautopia, I mean, that it's not mm -hmm. just an utopia. Mm -hmm. It's, it's actually something that is an utopia, but it's in the past, in the present, and the future. Mm -hmm. And I think you lose a little bit of that by taking the case study out. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, but you kept it in the end. Mm -hmm. So you rescue mm -hmm. that. Rescue different things. No, I just think if it were a regular length, you know, if it were an eight or nine thousand word yeah. article, yeah, that would make it a difference. Been, it would have been a huge difference. I think for me it was important to have both because I like this parallelism mm -hmm. between a project that is happening right now mm -hmm. and the science, uh, science fiction. You mm -hmm. know? So for me, this was really important. And if it was eight, nine thousand words, I think we would have kept it, you know. But on the other hand, you know, I knew another drawback. I knew the drawback that we haven't really researched the empirical case so well, you know. So I said, okay, if we haven't researched it so well and we use it as secondary information, why not mix it with also what is written in the literature, you know? Uh, but yes, ideally, my article, I would like have liked it to have linked uh, the two. So let's have Yorgos and then. Uh, 
I don't know, I have some broader comments, but uh, questions and comments at the same time. Uh, by taking out one uh, case study, and uh, actually by following the first reviewer's comments on using the, the novel as, if I understood well, as the lens of seeing the, uh, the growth. Mm -hmm. uh, but before that, all the three mm -hmm. reviewers said that the, the, the growth part uh, the growth part itself, like everything, mm -hmm. should be more elaborated. Mm -hmm. By doing so, uh, I felt some, something like you are now changing the focus of the of the paper. Mm -hmm. It's like introducing now the growth to the geographers. to the geographers. While in the first paper, you you took for granted that it's something it's discussed in the geographers, mm -hmm. and we offer an approach on specific elements of form. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is that from after the reviews, this is a major step, or it's my well, It's a major step, and for me the risk right now with this article is they might tell you what the risk is like, that this article now is too much about the growth and contributing to the understanding of the growth, which if I haven't convinced, haven't convinced the, the, the reviewers that this is important for geography, we are done, you know? Because before we had some other things that they were interested to geographers per se, no? It was like the conceptual contribution. So the growth interests me a lot, and our group here in Barcelona but doesn't interest necessarily geographers in the United States, you know? They are interested about utopias, futures. So maybe they say like, okay, you took out the dialectical utopia thing, mm -hmm. that was your main contribution and elaboration, and now you just talk to us about the very specific future that out there in Europe you're discussing, but you haven't convinced us Mm -hmm. You haven't convinced us that this is uh, relevant for all geographers. So this is where the risk now is for rejection. You know, if by taking out the dialectical utopia, they think we don't have enough theoretical substance in the article. I think, I mean, my feeling is that um, their proposal to focus on the novel is actually the key indicator that uh, this will be published. And I'm very optimistic about this, in a sense, because I think they pushed you into the direction of a theoretical paper while you wanted to kind of stick to the more empirical case study because you think yeah, you, For me, it was like, you're not, why are you, why do you need an empirical case study for a theory work? Mm -hmm. Theory in itself is, is creating of words. And the poem, the, 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 the material that you have from the novel was enough to create different world visions. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You don't need to exemplify this is what is already mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can do that as illustrations, but you don't necessarily need to do that. You can do that in another paper. Right. And I think they pushed you into the direction of theoretical paper, which is really great, because theory in itself is creative of, word, of worlds, and I think this is the indication that they want to publish it. For me, this is how I felt. Yeah. <laughs> I, the, that was exactly also my point before, that uh, for me also I found the empirical uh, case study not, of course, not uh, irrelevant, very relevant, but for this paper I think that, that the novel was enough. And the second thing is that I, I didn't understand that only the dialectical was removed, not the utopia. The, the utopian element of uh, Let's see the, the limits as nothing as something not uh, negative, something that we we can uh, understand it as uh, as a foundation for a different life. So I think that is still the, the main concept of the. Of it's there, but I mean the, the, it's there, the difference it's is like okay, they might say you are describing even in theoretical terms a very specific utopia, which is the growth, and you try to articulate it. But like, it what are you contributing? to the geography literature of utopias. You're just contributing, they might say, you know, they might say you're just contributing one more example. You're not contributing to the literature about dialectical utopias that you don't even review it, etc., etc. This is the, the, the risk. If, if the type of theory we are doing, let's say, is the type of theory they would like to see. Yeah. No, on this, I just, uh, the one thing I didn't like about the paper, the second version of it, was that you very explicitly say why geographers should care about this. Mm -hmm say geographers should care because this and that and that, and because they are geographers, they might find it a bit like, who are you to say, you know? Like it's very mm -hmm. uh, directly pointing to what you think should yeah, be important. Yeah, yeah. Maybe if you made it more implicit or more... Use the perhaps. <laughs> 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 That's the moment when you use the perhaps. 
But you maybe. know what I mean. Maybe it's also a bit of an ego. Perhaps geographers would find interest in this. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. maybe that was that, that's Why correct. Should? That was Why the wrong should? moment to be decisive, maybe. Mm -hmm. Because you're saying, no, that's not the things that interest geographers. You know, you, 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 you targeted the wrong exactly. things. So that's just a risk. Just like, it's just like Maria. I have to comment. Something regarding the format of the revision or something but I think the, the, the content of the second version. I have a I have doubts when I receive comments from reviews about some articles because some review as the second reviewer in, in of your article uh, he or she tells you that uh, you, you you should um, uh, this concept or this idea should be um, discussed, mm -hmm. no? And, and sometimes you say no. Mm -hmm. I, I guess that you, you have to choose, no? Sometimes, because if you follow all the comments that the review su mm -hmm. suggest you, you, you lose your objective. So how do you know when, if you should follow the, this comment or not? Because you, you, you repeat sometimes like, um, it would be very difficult to treat uh, surface cylindry with, within the limits because you, you have, yeah. or uh, this will be merit uh, a paper of, on its own, but... Yeah, that's a tricky balance there. So you saw that, and many times we say like, okay, they, they ask us, okay, they say dialectical utopia, you said, so you should mention Kant, Hegel, and Marx. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have never read Kant. German. I don't think now it's the time to read Kant. But I mean, I'm, I'm taking a tricky, so a tricky decision there, you know, because if this reviewer is really stuck with this idea, they might reject the paper for that. So you make a call there, you know, you make a call and you defend your case. So then you have to hope that you have to hope that you convince them that it was okay not to go in depth in that. But I think the tricky part is that you have to go in depth at least in some of the reviews. Because if you say, this happens to me sometimes when I'm a reviewer, now and I receive a paper, and they basically to everything they say, no, yes, I understand, I really appreciate your comment, but it's 8,000 words, so I can't do it. Yes, okay, once, twice, three, but if I give you five comments and all five comments you don't do them because it's 8,000 words, good luck, write it again, you know? I can't be responsible for you how you fit things in 8,000 words. So at some, that, some things you have to do. So the tricky balance there is like, okay, what you do and what you don't do and how you argue it. But be careful to avoid this approach, which is like, for almost everything I say, I'm not going to do it because it's 8,000 words, you know? This, this, won't, this won't work. I mean, I guess for this, you have to be very clear about what your objectives and your arguments are. And then, and exactly, and then exactly. So the point work. of arguing there is to clarify to the reviewers in the response what, are, what is the heart of your objective and why what they are arguing for you to expand on is not that important. So one reviewer told me, okay, why don't you engage with books in, you know? So I have to say, why I don't think, why first I acknowledge, no? First is you acknowledge, I say, I realize books in is important, and then he's mentioned in the growth. But then you have to make a convincing argument why you don't think this article loses something by not discussing books in. But you have, you have to make an argument there. You have to write an argument. You don't write in your paper, but you write in the response letter. That's why the response letter is really important. Because even there you make arguments. You make arguments about the work of books. In you might even refer, discuss it. So you can say in the, in, the, in the response letter, you can show that you are aware of certain things, but you make a conscious decision not to have them in the paper. Not that you don't know them, or uh, who is booksing, you know, what are you telling me? I don't get at all what you're talking about. But also you, with this thing of booksing, you did a very, I think, smart thing, because you asked to the reviewer to show you, to convince you how relevant uh, can it be and what can uh, this reference add to the paper. Yeah. So this is also, I think, a good, I think a good strategy, because you make a point, but also want to have more explanation from so the work. What, what, what were we saying indirectly there? So indirectly there, as I told you, you can always, you can always uh, catch the reviewers for not doing their job properly, mm -hmm. you know? This I've learned with working with people here that they do it often, you know? They, they, you can tell the reviewer, you haven't done your work well, so don't ask me to do it, you know? So if they tell you, ah, oh, you should deal with boxing, then it's like, okay, why should I deal with boxing? What precisely from boxing where, you know? If you didn't have time to think how boxing is relevant, why do you just throw it to me, you know? So it's like indirectly, 
I'm telling the reviewer, okay, you haven't done your work properly, so don't don't overemphasize boxing because you didn't tell me at all why I missed boxing. Like you make also a good review, you know. So this you can always play with the reviewer. You know, if you see that they haven't done something <coughs> properly, without being impolite, you can challenge them. Uh, yeah. The other thing is that. Uh, almost in every uh, notion that you use, they want uh, like uh, references and everything, like uh, for dialectical. Mm. But for me, also the, the book that The Space of Hope Harvey is not uh, mm. at all uh, accurate about uh, what does it mean for dialectical. Mm -hmm. uh, for emancipation, the same. They tell you what is emancipation here, why do you, you, you use uh, emancipation? Mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I think that finally a good advice is to avoid uh, to avoid uh, the notions and the words that uh, are... Uh, but these are concepts. Are concepts. Just, well, you yeah. don't have to avoid them, you have to... Yes, yeah, but you know, but, 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 you, but you saw at the... At the they, listen, there are two things here. Emancipation, it's true that we used it to, we didn't use it uh, correctly, you know, we didn't use it with the red coming. So it's just what I talked about fancy phrases before, you know, so emancipation, revolution, you know, like there are some words that we might use that we just use them to make fancier argument, you know, and then if we don't really mean them seriously, then it's better to take them out. So it was correct that the reviewer caught us on there, on that. Dialectical was more tricky because dialectical was central to our article because we were claiming theoretically about a particular type of seeing utopias as dialectical utopias. So this was central to the article. We were using it seriously, or we thought we were using it seriously. And then he, he or she told us, okay, you have to really read about dialectics. And they told us if Harvey didn't do his job well, this doesn't excuse you from not doing your job well. You can improve on Harvey. You're publishing on a top journal. So it's your responsibility to improve on Harvey's shallow treatment of dialectical utopias. This is what basically we told us. So for us, the decision there was like, okay, is it really dialectical utopias that we want to develop or we want to present the growth? And we went for the second path. But it's, it's risky, you know, because someone might say, no, you should have developed dialectical utopia. Without it, the article doesn't make a contribution to geography, you know? But for me, the, the, most, the, the thing that missed a little bit from the article for a, geo, for a geographical journal was more the spatio-temporal character of what exactly... Yeah, there was the scale thing at the end that my colleague yeah, yeah. about. So the scale was very geographical, the scarcity discussion is relevant to geography, but yes, there, there are elements that they are missing and they might not be enough. Yes. Who else wanted to No, no, about the scale, uh, it was, uh, I think, um, I mean, it's a good point to make, but uh, in also in your final version, I think is a shallow treatment of uh, the scale issue. Mm -hmm. So, like, then it, does it make sense to add the scale just to seduce geographer right, if you cannot uh, make a uh, strong contribution? Yeah. I mean, I was worried about it, but then they didn't put it in the revision. So yeah. that's another example, you know. So I was I was worried about the scale section, but then none of the three reviewers took issue with the scale section. So. Maybe, yeah, but like, this is fine, you know, in the mm -hmm. sense that this is, again, here is like you're getting pragmatic about getting published, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yes, if I was reading the article again and I said, how can I improve it, maybe the scale section, we would improve it, you know. But, like, at that stage, you're not trying to make the perfect article, you're trying to convince the reviewers. Mm -hmm. So, if the reviewers didn't have problem with scale, fine, you know. Yeah. It's, it's as it is. And you're sure to go back to the, the same reviewers because sometimes they'll send it to new ones? Yeah, that, 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 okay, that's very smart. <laughs> <laughs> really? But maybe basically the new reviewers will look at what the other reviewers said, you know, so they, they can't come with totally new things in their revision. I'm sure it will be published, but in case it's not published later, you're going to do like rewrite, oh, yeah. write again. No, if it's not published, I think we're going to expand it and use 8, 9,000 words because now it's really short and then submit it to another journal, like to a forum or something like that. Something like that. Okay, I'm um, playing the devil's advocate a bit. Uh, since you focus on the novel, and that's when we were talking about acknowledging weaknesses, at the beginning of the new version, there's a point quite early that you say, okay, we're not going into technological <coughs> details about how science fiction can contribute to geography. Mm -hmm. But it's actually one of the central issues now. Yeah. Because you're working on another. So 
So I was wondering, I know it's a problem as of work on it to be arguing like that. Mm -hmm. But isn't now the connection of literary, stu literary studies and criticism like really relevant? To it's really relevant. That's, that's another weakness of the article. So that's another thing you can pick us up. Mm -hmm. you know? So they can pick us up on these things, that if some people thought that the main contribution was that we were using science fiction in geography and then we don't explain why we do it or how we do it. So the risk right now of this paper is that it's too much, it's still theoretical but about the growth, you know. And you might not, if it doesn't resonate with them, why well, it's important to discuss the growth. And then all these other things have been left out, like why science fiction, why dialectical, etc. But uh, is, the, maybe, is it so innovative in geography to use a novel? I don't know. They claim it is, yes. <laughs> but they use it so much in geography, of course. I read in the... Or science fiction, let's say. They don't use science fiction to discuss environmental future so much. I read in the, in the American, in the, in the Annals of American Geography, one paper that was called The Future of Cruelty, <laughs> to explain the violence in the Annals through Antonin Artaud, mm -hmm. the French uh, surrealist. I was a bit surprised at the collective paper, but they're discussing theories of theater to explain. Mm. Uh, for me, that was another reason why I didn't try to go there, because I don't really know what geographers have done. I don't know about eco-criticism and eco literary criticism. And how. So this, this, again, was huge work, you know, that we couldn't do in the revision phase. So again, that's, that's important, like what can you do and what not, you know? Maybe we should have done it. It was a little bit extra work. and. If you are two authors, also you say, okay, one of us is just gonna try to see whatever has been published in the annals on eco criticism, etc., and try to write at least a few sentences to contribute also to these discussions. This this was something we could have done, but also it was so short, six thousand words, that this would be too difficult. But that was the other limitation. I'm thinking that uh, well, if you if you see the the, the, the content, oh, your main contribution is about uh, limits uh, without scarcity, and this is clearly said and say in your um, your paper, and this is a let's say I would say an important contribution to the include literature that normally treats scarcity in a way that is not exactly in line to what you want to show this uh, engagement with the novel. But still, what I think is missing, theoretically, because one part that was uh, very weak in, in your first draft was exactly the case studies. Mm -hmm. But I think that the best thing to do is to take it out because it was completely not well worked. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course, here, if you have to just revise in four months, you cannot do a proper job in terms of case studies. But then I think the point that you are missing to contribute to the geography is exactly is this point of limits without scarcity relevant in the utopia discussion geography? And how this contribution in the uh, deep book will contribute also to the reflection of geography about utopia? In the reflection of geography in utopia, there is a problem of scarcity and limits. Mm -hmm. They are treating them in different way. How they treat them? And now this reflection from the good will contribute to that theory aspect. I think this is probably the most or the, the weakest part of, of, the, of your paper now. Yeah, we could have had a discussion of how geographers deal with scarcity and limits, you know. So we didn't have it. We just had one reference to Harvey 1974, the classic, where he, he goes against Malthusians and saying, you know, this is the idea of external limits is wrong, you know, it's dangerous politically. So we're just dealing with Harvey 1974, so someone might as well tell you like Harvey 1974 has been elaborated a lot, you know? So, all these yeah. are weaknesses. Yeah, in this way, way, you were just associating you with geography. I said, I agree with you that scarcity should be treated in this way. As Harvey said to us... No, 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 I'm, I'm writing more to Harvey. I'm saying like Harvey, I'm saying Harvey, Harvey is right to criticize Malthusianism, but he's the way he criticizes is missing another point, that you might demand limits without being Malthusian. So that, that, that's my point. So implicitly I'm saying we're contributing something to the discussion about scarcity in geography. And like, in my heart I know it, because I go to conferences of geography and they, basically everyone has different case studies to tell you what Harvey said, that Malthusianism is politically dangerous and there are no external limits, etc. You know? So I think there is a contribution there, but the thing is, we don't make it 
as explicit as we should have in the paper, like picking up a few phrases or a few papers that they have been published by geographers recently about scarcity and saying that we are saying something different. So this is a weakness. So I think the other thing I want from this discussion, and we are finishing here, for you to get is, okay, at least you know it, but to, why did I give you this internal, internal communication? Is to see that every paper, I mean, every paper has it's full of uh, problems and weaknesses and, uh, and unfinished points and incomplete points, you know, full. And the author knows them, you know them, I mean, I know them now, like what you tell me is right, you know, I know that these are weaknesses. So like accept what are the weaknesses and try to, to navigate your way, like don't, first of all, don't be reactive and say, no, there are no weaknesses in my paper, you didn't understand me, you're biased, that's the other approach, which is very common, but I don't agree with this approach. And it's like, okay, I know there are weaknesses, Try to improve them and then good luck, you know, it's like best of luck. Sometimes you'll be like, sometimes not. But someone told me, I didn't find that, but someone told me, Vicky Vegas here, who's a professor in our department, told me that there is this web, this paper or web page where Nobel Prize economists shared publicly, they reviews their papers for which they got Nobels, got the first time they submitted them, you know. Mm. And I say you'll see the last year comments ever made, you know. It's like this is bullshit, this is ridiculous, <laughs> this, this is not a contribution. And this is for Nobel Prize economists, you know, for, for their main works. Like they said, I have to ask what's the name of this article. That, so they shared it, and I think it's nice that they shared it, you know, because even the papers that they get the most famous, probably the first reviewer hated them, so it's not, it's not a problem. Now, reviewers are to hate your papers, you have to argue with them, and if you're lucky, you, you proceed, you know, it's not a... Just a few, a few points that I might have missed in this discussion. It's like, if you show, we wrote a very, a very long response, no? So it was 16 pages. pages. This is to show, first of all, that you did, you worked for the revision. In a way, also, you give work to the reviewers. This is important to do it, you know? Because this makes, them, this makes your relation, your power relation to the reviewer more equal. So it's not just them asking you, but you are asking them also to put work. So if it's 16 pages, it's like, okay, if you really want to criticize my, page, my paper, read these 16 pages and tell me why you disagree. Well, it's not just I wrote one, two paragraphs and then you can destroy me easily, also with one or two paragraphs. Like, I did a lot of work, so you have to respect me and take it seriously. Like, make them hate you when I mean that, you know? Make them, oh my God, they sent me 16 pages reviewed, you know? They will hate you for that, but they will also take you seriously. Because they will know that they will have to read your stuff carefully because you put a lot of work on that. The other thing we did is we show we break it point by point now. So may, some people don't do that. They respond to the reviewers in general. I find the point by point uh, useful. Mm -hmm. And sometimes use it strategically, you know, so you decide where to break the point. Mm -hmm. You saw also that some points we were just saying thank you, very nice comment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Why were we doing this? Because the, the editor who's going to get the paper will not remember what the paper is about. And he's not going to remember the positive comments of reviewers about it. So if you just focus on the negative ones, then they just see the negative ones. So you have to remind them also, no, the reviewers are also positive about our paper, you know? So that's why you just put them again and you say thank you, you know? You, good point, you noticed that we did that yeah. very well, you know? Mm -hmm. So then the editor reads it and remembers, okay, it was balanced. Some things were positive, some things were negative. It was just the negative stuff responding to that. Another thing that is important is at the beginning of the letter, always to summarize to the editor also your main point that changes. You know? So you write a response to the editor and then a response to its reviewer point by point. So you have to write like a sort of abstract of your response. You know? This one we said it, like always acknowledge, so that you understand, use your own words to show that you understand what the comment is about. Don't just wave it around, oh I understood it, you know, no thank you, very good comment, but that, you know, thank you, I understand that, this was that, you know, so like use your own words to really gesture to the reviewer that you understand what they are talking to you about, you know. And then if you need to confront it and disagree, disagree, you know. You don't have to, be, to agree, but you have to show that you understand. That's the important thing. Mm -hmm. So the reviewer wants to see you, that they understand your, you understand their criticism and you are dealing with it. If you are dealing by doing what they tell you or not, it's not that important. As important it is 
to show that you understand what they are telling you and you are taking it seriously. That's that's the main the main trick. And the, uh, the last thing we said, you know, you can use one reviewer against the other, but then you have to be careful also how you do that. Mm -hmm. Any questions before we finish? Or comments? Or experiences that we didn't cover? For me, we didn't discuss so much about the intermediate parts of the article, which is also very important, about how do we write the empirical uh, uh, part of the article. I think that we focused a lot on the abstract, on the conclusions, on the discussion, and on the review process, but there is also, for instance, you know that we had a problem with this thing, how we write uh, the empirical study, like chronologically or in the divided in uh, themes in each in themes or uh, uh, the critical part is the most tricky so what did i try to say in this presentation no, i didn't explore it perhaps so when i went to a presentation of natural scientists about how to write articles what they do there is like and if you do quantitative work that's relevant so what they do is like if they do statistics econometrics or etc what they do is they start with the graphs and the tables there so they say like okay i have three graphs or three econometric tables I start by them like a storyboard, you know? My storyboard is figure one, figure two, figure three, you know? And then my text is supporting these main findings that I saw in my figures. How does this speak to a qualitative case study, like the one we are doing now? Because we don't have figures or a storyboard. Mm -hmm. The equivalent in our case is the arguments that I said. That's why I emphasize the story, the sentence outline. Mm -hmm. So think, which are your five main arguments? And I, I, I would say structure your paper around this, make a storyboard, like argument one, argument two, argument three, argument four. That's how they write scenarios for movies, for example, no? People have like different scenes, different accounts, and then they say, okay, this scene, this is going to happen, and this is the main point of this scene. This is the other one, and then they break it into sub-scenes, and finally they end up with a dialogue. And the natural scientists do the same with figures. We can do the same with arguments. So I want to argue five things. Each argument has like three sub points and has this evidence. So try to think as a, as a scenario based on your five arguments. The historical approach can be nice, but it runs the risk of being very descriptive and very chronological, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you, follow a chrono if you follow a historical approach, this started then and finished then, but then each period must be an argument, you know? Or the way you approach the history has to have different arguments. Otherwise, you become too descriptive, saying, okay, first this happened, then they made this down, then they made the other down, and finally they had this conflict, and then this, this down was made. I'm not saying <laughs> I, did, I did dumps too, you know? So uh, I'm talking about my dumps. <laughs> So you know the history of dumps, I've written a lot of history of dumps, which is very dumb boring. <laughs> so try to think of arguments, not of history. But then we can have histories that exemplify the argument. I mean, can you tell like, like a short story in yeah, which, uh, in which uh, you can see the contradictions or... Uh, yeah, yeah. or you can have five arguments and each one has a small history. Or you have a history evolving over time where it's period you make one argument, or you can think of different, but think of arguments, don't think of descriptive tasks you have. But in general, it's, it's not a very good idea, to, it's a good idea to, to split the arguments and try to, to answer, or to, to explore, to... I mean, there are different styles of writing, know, but so I Because, for instance, the, the friends, that we were talking before, they do the, another thing. They take an argument, from it, they elaborate on this argument, and they generate the other thing. From they generate the, other They generate, yes. yes. It is like a, a way of generation from one argument to the other. Yes, you can do that too, but there are the different argument. arguments. So even if you read Foucault, Governmentality, because I did it from my class, you know, and then I, I was saying very clearly that each paragraph had one argument, you know, with some examples, and then another argument. Now, how do you move from argument to argument? You can move through logic, through history, through whatever, you know, but like more or less each paragraph had one argument. It didn't have like ten arguments mixed together and then ten different arguments. There was one main point in each paragraph or section. Amelie, last one and we finish. We'll go for that. No, I find it very 
tricky how to write and the kind of things that we write, how to give the context. Because a lot of our case studies, you need to give uh, maybe a short history or like a geographical setting, whatever. And I remember in, in my draft that you commented that this was too extensive or it becomes too descriptive and it becomes too long. And yeah, that's an art. That's, that's a difficult art, no? Like, you are right about the dance in Himalaya and you assume that, you, you know that someone will read it and will not know anything about Himalaya or about... So you have to give the context, no? It's this region which is there. Generally, I would say you have to do this with an economy of words, you know? Don't spend too... If you spend too much on this description, then it's not good, you know? Think of a movie, you know? Like, good movies... They give you a lot of information, but through the plot, you know, they don't start by giving you all the context. This person is that, that person is that, that's the city where they live and this is happening. You start in a city in Tehran and you get it, you know, it's a city in Tehran. You, you haven't been in Iran or Tehran, but you get the point very quickly, you know, and you see the characters and what is happening. So there is a lot of indirect information coming with a lot of economy of images or words. But that's an art, so this, mm -hmm. yes, I don't have words to express how to do it. But definitely the way to do it is not three pages of describing Himalaya objectively as if you're writing a, you know, for a report or for a geography bachelor's description of a place, you know? So like, the information about the Himalayas has to come through your main argument somehow, and then like a short description in, yeah. Uh, I usually do the, the, the exactly the opposite to what Amelie said because I focus on what exactly do I want to say in this paper and I forget to actually give more information about the context because mm -hmm. I assume that people already know. Yeah. And, and in a way it's better because I'm more focused but then they remind me so maybe we should give us more information here about what happened here, what happened here. So yeah, they yeah. ask me for specific information so I don't have to write a whole history from the beginning. So this can be a trick that you can do, you know. With the actual data information, you can insert it. It's very easy. But then, like, the most important yeah. thing is that you are clear about your argument. What exactly do you want to So that's a good advice. Focus on your arguments, and then if people tell you, okay, I don't understand where was this coming from, or yeah. what do you mean, or what is happening in Romania when you said about the revolts in Romania, like, give me more information. Because it's easier to do that, yeah. that and spend a lot of information on the revolt in Romania that then you might not need for your arguments, you know. So better be thin on this type of contextual information than be too thin. Well, I can share an experience. In this sense, it's true. I've normally thrown in the you know rubbish bin like 80% of the information I had from field work. In my papers, the part I cut the most always in the end is always in the field work. And the, the context. Field work. Not the context, but no, the part the on the field work, the details of the conflict, all this. It always goes like, it's always reduced in like... So and maybe the conceptual, uh, yeah. next time yeah. I do, and then you do the conceptual. Yeah. So. But that's another thing, like, we, this is what I said at the beginning, that sometimes you feel, oh, I can't throw all this information out, I collected all these interviews, I have all these quotes that I found interesting, etc. But, like, don't feel that you're throwing away things, like, you're just economizing and passing your argument and your feeling on that, you know? It's like, it's like the montage of a movie, you know? You might have five hours of movie, but then you cut it down to two, to two hours, so... Of course, you work and you shoot out for hours, but that's not the reason not, not to cut it. As long as your main points get through. So your, your objective is always there. The ball is this, now it's like your arguments passing through and being convincing. Now, if for this you have to use all your interviews or you just use a few interviews, it's fine, you know. Don't feel that you have to be loyal to all the information you collected. You don't have to be loyal to it, you know. You have to be loyal just to your readers and your research community, not to the work you put in the past.